Yeah, nah, that's all good. That's all good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll make a wee start, but uh, J Bro, thank you so much for uh, coming on. Um, yeah, no, it's an honour. Thank you. I know, I know that you're a busy man. You've got family. You've got life. Uh, we're all busy, so it's yeah, nice to yeah. time out of your day just to come on, speak to myself. But before we nah, get started, before we get started, how are you doing? Yeah, no, I'm doing great. Just uh, being a family guy these days. Um, I'm working as a pond builder, so I'm building fish ponds for right. Bell's Water Gardens in uh, Ballarat. So that's what I'm doing a lot these days. So has the rock star drummer retired? No, I wouldn't say I'm retired, but I'm not doing it, I guess, on that level. Um, I'm still doing it for fun. I have a few students. Uh, I live outside of Melbourne in a, a town called Ballarat. So uh, I, have, I have my drum set still set up and uh, play a little bit. Now and then I'll, I'll do a fill-in gig for uh, this local a local band called uh, John McManara Blues uh, Bruce Project. And uh, they have a drummer, but they just call me once in a while. So I get to just have my leg back in there, you know. Yeah, but yeah. it's not completely out of the out of the door. Yeah. Uh, so, hey, bro, we're going to sp speak about all things music, but what we're going to do is go back to the very beginning for yourself. So, yes. first of all, where were you born? Where were you brought up? I was uh, born and raised in South Africa, Bloemfontein, the Orange Free State. It was like... Uh, Right in the middle of South Africa, so I was I was born and raised. I was left South Africa probably in '96. We moved to New Zealand, and then I came to Melbourne, and that's when it all happened. So, from a very young age, were you into music? Very young. Yes. Yeah, my father is a drummer too, so I watched my dad play quite a lot back then, and all I wanted to do is play drums. Uh, my mum plays piano. My grandfather was a musician too, so yeah, it was always around me. So that was definitely, I'm assuming that was the main influence as to why you also picked that instrument? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, just being around my dad, watching him play, I uh, yeah. was quite fascinated that it was a noisy instrument too. So I figured as, as any little kid, like now I have my two-year-old and he's doing the same with me. He just follows me and wants to play when I play, you know? And I suppose it's that thing that uh, normally most parents would probably steer their children away from the drums because not only are they expensive, they're very noisy. Oh, yeah. yes. Dad already had drums set up, then you were already stuck with it. Exactly. Now, look, nowadays you can get mesh heads and all the quiet stuff and the tools to put on the drums. Back in the day, it was a lot harder. I mean, I've annoyed a lot of neighbours. But um, <laughs> having, <laughs> having, having the ability to have electronic drum set now or put silent mesh heads on it you can do that headphones all that sort of stuff it really helps and I, I i'm doing it uh with the kits that i have for my son when he wants to just bash away you know it's not too loud so he still gets to have a bit of fun but keeps everyone happy back when you were very young was your music i'm assuming your musical influences was coming from your parents so what type yes. of, what type of music were they listening to you know, I listen, my dad, growing up, growing up, you know, around the house, it was a lot of different music from um, Deep Purple to Led Zeppelin to Police to Journey, um, all that sort of rock, classic rock stuff that was around me, Phil Collins, Genesis. Yeah. My dad put me to a lot of, uh, he always educated me in a lot of great drummers, you know, like check out Keith Moon from The Who. Um, yeah. So I got to absorb that, you know, just listening to, there was always music in the house, you know, yeah. he always played it. Uh, so a lot of people are influenced by what they hear from their parents initially. Absolutely. And then they, they will discover their own type of music that, that they yes. enjoy something to them. So yes. do you remember what age you were when you discovered your own type of music and, and what bands was it that you were discovering? You know, when well, once we moved to New Zealand, it was a whole new culture around me. So um, as I met friends and stuff, uh, it was bands like local acts, like a band called She Had from New Zealand. Unbelievable band. And that was my first actual concert, seeing a live rock band that's got a lot of la a volume, you know. And uh, I was really fascinated with that. And ever since then, I was just going, steering into that direction. And that's when... No Duke Cartel and all those bands came about. It was just being in that rock and roll kind of road that I was trying to find, you know. And was there any other musical instruments or was it purely just drums? Is that all you were interested in? Purely just drums. You know, I studied with a lot of many different drum teachers. So um, I would drive 
I lived in when I lived in New Zealand. I was the the furthest, the closest drum teacher that was a that had knowledge was in Auckland. So I would have to go there once a week to study, and、um, you know, trying to learn from guys like and they were most of them were all jazz drummers. So me being a rock guy studying with jazz guys, they were always complaining I was playing way too loud. But、um, the technique all came from them, you know, learning、yeah. from guys like that. It's also weird as well, like trying to learn your instrument when you're younger. I, I think we're probably of a similar age.、Um, yep. So when you brought up, there was no internet, there was no YouTube that you could just、no. type. And、um, no. I play the guitar, but what yep, I had, yep. what I had said to someone previously was, even back in the the eighties or nineties. When you were trying to learn something, you couldn't go online to figure it out. And even if you see music video, a lot of the music videos, it, it wasn't really showing you what the the musician was actually playing. You were、mm. hoping maybe find a live concert where you could actually see what、exactly. they were doing. I'm guessing it would have been the same for yourself. Oh yes, I would finding video tapes. Mates would uh, uh, borrow me their and lend me their video tapes. You know. That I would try to watch bands, or you would try to record it on the video player. You know, if there's like a live thing on TV.、Um, I've also been in record stores. It was the best feeling, just going into record stores and, and trying to find all the greatest musicians. You know, that you were interested in. Back when the record stores existed, before they all started,、yeah. down, which is a, exactly. A it's a completely different world now we're living in, isn't it? You know,、yeah. it's it's But,、uh, crazy. So obviously, I know that you're.、Uh, The main band that I kind of know you through is Duke Cartel. So yes, they started、yep. off in Australia, yeah, and then moved to LA.、Mm-hmm. But I believe that you were with them. How how did you come across the band? How did you get to know them? How did you eventually become the drummer for Duke Cartel? It, it was just word of mouth.、Um, when I lived in when I was in Melbourne at the time, I was doing a lot of playing around there, and I was also trying to. You know, just get into the industry and talk to a lot of different people, and、yep. just being at a place. I was doing an audition at, at a place called Deluxe Studios with a band at that day, and then、uh, before the audition, I was always early, so I was would chat to the local bloke there that works there. Funny、yep. enough, he was the one that knew Duke Cartel were looking for a drummer, and he kind of got in touch with me, and that's how it all came about. It's kind of funny. He went for an audition. You know, with the band, and then it was completely how it worked out. Just、so、talking to that bloke. Had you heard of them before? No, I I'd never heard of them before. No,、um, working in I worked in a rehearsal studio for a bit. So、um, a lot of there was another guy I knew there that that was also trying out for them, and that, he had the CD. He's like, dude, I tried it. He's another drummer, and he, he tried out for them, and he gave me the CD. So I had a bit of a head start by the time. I got the music. I was already learning the songs. Right,、um, worked out pretty good there too. <laughs> And、uh, can I can I ask why did the、um, why did the, they replace Eddie? Because they, they never seemed to fall out. They all seemed to be on good terms. But yeah, yeah, always came across from from my point of view. That maybe he didn't want to move to America, and, and that's why they had to find someone else. Was that the case, or was it something different? You know, I, I don't really hundred percent know, but from just from kind of what I heard, I think he wanted to pursue more as a singer. He's an unbelievable drummer too, but I think he just wanted to become.、Um, he wanted to follow that path as a, a to do vocals as well, and I guess he just wanted to go on that journey for a bit. And、um, as a drummer. So when you sit down and, and you、uh, two seconds, I don't know. No, no, that's all right. Is this the CD you're meaning? Yes, that's the one. That's the one. Yes. So when you when when you sit down and listen to that, now obviously yourself and Eddie have different styles of playing drums. It's the same as、yep. everybody. Different instruments. Of course. Yes. Yep. So I'm assuming you were like, I'm not going to try and recreate. Exactly what he's playing, but I'm going to put my own spin on it, but try and keep、mm. it with it in vain. Is that pretty much how you put it? Exactly, exactly the same approach. Exactly, yes. I remember they took it. He's quite happy for you to, you know, I'm going to try and do this, or were they quite happy、yeah. for to give you free reign to try whatever? Absolutely, you want? absolutely to a certain extent. Yeah,、um, as long you know, like by the time I started, a lot of the stuff that they were working on with Eddie. 
that was supposed to be released got scrapped as well. So it right. was a good opportunity when I came in. We we had the label, and we went to Seattle where we tracked a whole new album. Yeah. So that's where I was had the opportunity to put my own spin to it. You know, yeah. um, working with the, the producer there with Rick Barisher at the time. Yeah. So I asked Tommy the same question, and. He'd said that, um, I, I don't know how long Duke Cartel had been going for prior to yourself joining. Long time. But he said that they were getting success within Australia. You know, they were supporting some big bands. Yes. And obviously at some point, Toby had decided to appear on Rockstar Supernova. Mm -hmm. Yes, and yes. I had said to him, what was your feelings on that? Because if, if I was in your situation, part of me would be thinking... This is brilliant for my friend. He, he could he could um, get some success through this. Yes. And then part, part of me would also be thinking, we might lose our singer um, yeah. through this. Yeah. What, yeah. Were, what were your thoughts um, when Toby had said that he was thinking about applying for this um, reality TV show? I wasn't in the band at the time. That was prior right. to me. So when I joined him, that was when he actually just came off the show. So all that blew up as I just kind of walked into it. And what the same question I'd asked to, to, to Tommy as well was when Toby had, to, he said that Toby had called him to say, listen, I don't think I'm going to win it. I'm probably going to come second or third. What I would suggest you do is get yourself over here because mm. we can use this as a platform to launch this mm. band outside of Australia. Mm. Now, Tommy had said, his bags were packed. He was ready to go. Yeah, yeah. But if you didn't have any anything tying you down, if you didn't have family um, or maybe a certain career, I could imagine it be, would be quite easy when you're that age to simply mm -hmm. drop everything and just go for it. Absolutely. If you didn't have something tying you down, it might be more of a decision to make. Were you quite happy to simply drop everything and just oh, go yeah. for it? Absolutely. I was ready. I was ready because I was working my way up to that whole point. Um, for years, it's taken me from jumping from band to band and learning yeah. uh, to get to that moment because all I wanted to do was go to America and play music. And yeah. doing it with a great band from Australia, was the opportunity was there, and I just jumped on it and went, went yeah. for it. I mean, I remember Tommy did say that he was always worried that you would be known as the, the band with the singer from the reality TV show. But personally, just from an outsider looking in, I, I definitely think Toby was correct that using the show, the, the best thing that ever happened was that he never won it. The best thing was that he came second or third because it, it was exactly what, what he'd done, which was he just used it as a launch pad for the band I, would the band have ever got to outside of Australia without it? I would like to think that they would have, but who knows? But it definitely was just, he almost got the, the best of both worlds. He got exposure from the show, but mm -hmm. he didn't get tied to the band. That, Absolutely. That, that created, and, uh, and it gave Cartel that launch pad. But, Absolutely. So were you just ready for LA and for America and everything that came with it? Yeah, I mean, I was also very young, so I was I had a lot of drive and stuff, but I was also, I just didn't have the experience, you know, and, and that whole journey was such a life experience, I can tell you, um, knowing so much now what I know and what I knew then, you know, but I, I was ready, I was ready to go and just explore and, and, and just see what it's like, you know. What, yeah. what do you think made, um, what do you think made Duke Cartel work, and I, and I don't mean in terms of success, but... Um, when you look at a lot of bands, they'll maybe have four or five members and what they'll normally have is one or two leaders that steer the ship and I don't mean they dictate to the others what happens, they steer the ship and the, usually the other members are happy to get behind them, they trust mm -hmm. their judgement with yes. where the band is heading. What made Duke Cartel work? You know, uh, just the, the passion, the drive, we all had that same drive of wanting to play music and create it. You know, like we will always be in the studio creating music together as a band. Yeah. So we all had that same passion, you know, but um, 
there was a lot of it was a lot of a learn learn it was a, it was a learning process for all of us you know having to learn this because I didn't know much about the music industry and before that and how it worked yeah is there a particular gig concert that you've played that sticks in your mind that that was just better than the rest or one that stood out as just being this is what it should be yeah it was always good I always had fun I just it was it's like every time I play it I just like I go into a trance and I just don't know how to explain it but I, it's like I'm there but I'm not really there I'm just kind of so focused into what I'm doing um, yeah. it was always it was always just a good feeling walking away from it you know from every gig I mean AJ said that as well that it didn't matter how your day was going, whether you'd had an argument at home. Yeah. Maybe if you were one of the members, was if you were having a bit of a falling out or that, the minute you guys stepped on stage, oh, everything, it's on. everything was forgotten and mm. it was 100% mm. focused on the music. Exactly. And the five of you that were playing, you just clicked. And it, yes. it, just, it just worked. And it's hard to maybe, um, if it was that easy for all bands, they would do it, but it, it doesn't happen with all bands. There's all there's sometimes that bit that something missing. Mm, yes, and no, definitely. Um, also, you know, trying to force something. So I've noticed sometimes you know, when you write with bands, when you're trying to force the process or the creative yeah. input, doesn't always work that well. You know, um, yeah. just by letting it flow. You know, just I think that thing that happen. was. I think the thing that that you've maybe had, apart from the fact that these were all capable musicians. And you've had the drive. You's all, you's all got on well. You were all, say, you know, your personalities worked yeah. together, and that, oh, yeah. that a big thing that that can destroy bands. Yeah. Oh, definitely. It uh, it happens a lot. Yeah, we were like we were like family. You know, we we would be in a van together, and then we'll be in the studio together, and then we even lived together at times. You know, so we had we we had we learned a lot about each other. You know, and who so, each other are as people. Got a question about the the albums, right? So, this is the first one that yes. came out. That's the right. one. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, great album. This is is this the one you recorded in Seattle? That's correct. Yes, with Rick Parisher. He did like Blind Melon, Pearl Jam, all those grunge bands yeah. back in the day. So it's a great album, right? But um, a few years later, this one came out. Yes, yes. Right? Yep. And there's there's a few, four or five of the songs on this album were on this album, right? Yes. Yeah, so, they want, we remixed them. Well, I was going to say that they were remixed, but were those ones recorded, the, were the rest of them recorded separately? Uh, some of them, like probably one or two of them, I think, I know if only was already recorded that was just mixed but yeah some of the other songs we might have tracked again on um, Sabi was remixed as well I think but yeah. we put a lot of lot, it was half and half we recorded that in LA and then some of the previous songs that we did we just remixed them with was that. it was that why you didn't just do 12 completely new songs what was the reason having sort of set from the first album remixed you know, that I, I, to be honest with you, that wasn't my department to make the decision. Um, they just decided to remix it and just bring it out. I actually didn't know, you know, yeah, why they did was, that. I kind of just sat on, on the side there and just kind of took it in. Yeah. yeah. And um, do you like recording? Do you like creating things from... Oh, I love, I love recording. It's, uh, it's a different ball game, you know, compared to live. Um, but I do, I do prefer being in a studio more. Um, just creating music. And how did you guys go about writing a new song? So, for example, would, would yep. Toby or somebody else come in with mm -hmm. a, a very basic song structure? Yes. Yeah. And then would you all start contributing to it and, and building it? Yeah, like Toby would sometimes come up with just a basic acoustic riff. And, you know, might put some vocals down. And a lot of times he would record these things on his phone. And he'll just email it to us, you know, and then everyone has to kind of listen to it and soak it up. And then we'll be in the studio together and we'll just pull it apart and put it back together. And everyone kind of try to throw their own ideas into it. Yeah. Do you prefer recording to performing live? 
I like it. I, it's different. It's more different, you know. Um, y- you get with recording, you get to do it again. <laughs> Live, you get to do it once. <laughs> you know, yeah. you got to nail it. Um, Is that? But with rec- yeah. But I was going to say the other thing that Tommy and both AJ both agreed on. They both said this was that the biggest struggle with recording Duke Cartel is that you really struggle to capture the sound of the band live because live, you guys took it to a whole new level. And yes. as much as the albums sound really good, if you put on any live recording on, on YouTube, the song there's something that just, I don't know if it's the feeding back from the crowd, but there's, the songs all go up another level. And oh, it's both, just the energy that you feed off crowds, exactly. Yeah, you know. both said that they struggled, you struggled to capture the live feeling, but I think a lot of bands probably are similar. I think, you know, the thing with live, you can get into your head a lot more because you have people there watching you, so, you know, you sometimes I find you can put a wall up and your brain and your mind can be so powerful. You can be such a good musician, and if you have a slight doubt or thinking about, oh, I'm going to if that that drum fell up or something, well, you're probably creating that, you know. It's 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 a mental thing, really, as well, live, because you have everyone watching you, you know. Yeah, and what about, so you were talking earlier about going to a music store, looking through CDs and stuff like that. So when, yeah. when, when we were younger, we would have been the same, that we would have went to a, a music shop and you would have flicked through the CDs and you would have been the same as myself. You would have probably bought albums having never heard the band or the music, simply yes. based album cover. Yeah, And yeah. the way you access music nowadays, you get it from streaming, you get it from downloading. There's a, yeah. there's a whole generation, I feel that the artwork is almost completely lost, but to yeah. somebody of my generation, I, I still feel it's important. Do you still think artwork is important? Oh, 100%. Absolutely, and the booklets that you can read through, it's always so cool. You know, I miss that. I really do. It's changed yeah. so much. It's changed I mean, so I much. And vinyl, vinyl is definitely coming back, and it is oh, really yes. cool. Yes. Some of the album covers. Yeah. Like, but... Oh, yeah. It's become that kind of trend, you know, that it started to take off again with the younger generation, which is cool to see. And out, out of, um, obviously, but there's those couple of albums there was the, the the Lost Tapes EP. What What's two or three of your favourite songs from Duke Cartel days? Of, of what we created? Yeah. Um, Road of Glass, I really enjoyed playing. Um, Save Me was another corker that I loved. Um, the Sign, I really enjoyed playing that one too. That, yeah. was, that was a fun one to play. So I, I know that the band... The band, it was management, I suppose, that was the final nail in the coffin for the, the band kind of ending. I know you still get together and you do gigs um, now and again, but um, speaking with Tommy, he, he he told me he was absolutely gutted that the band ended. He was just, you know, he'd said for years there'd been these milestones that, and the, the, he just kept reaching them and then it, it mm. just got to this point where he remembers thinking is it ever going to move to the next level at, at some point it seemed to kind of just sort of stop and uh, I was speaking with AJ and that guy has got the passion man he is just absolutely up for it and, yeah. uh, and he he felt that you should have kept going because he thought the band had enough potential with or without the label you were going to make it Mm, so he mm. also said that the band had ended. What was your feelings when the band kind of came to an end? You know, it was, it was, you know, I can't, I was just, I think I was just also over it when it came to that point. You know, my whole drive kind of changed at that time. And uh, we like, like you say, we push and push and push and you just kind of hit that point where you get more frustrated with the whole process, you know, yeah. because uh, nothing is happening or something always falls through. And you, you kind of don't hang on to it as much, you know. Um, at that point, yeah, I was done, you know, when yeah. it came to that. And Dale was moving back to L.A., oh, back to Melbourne with Tommy. Um, so once that kind of happened, it was done. 
You know, it was like, yeah, it's not going to keep going, um, uh, which was I unfortunate. Mean, yeah, I remember him, um, obviously, AJ was was 100% like, you know, let's keep going. Mm. Mm. Um, Tommy didn't want it to end, but I was kind of thinking in my head, well, I suppose Tommy's been doing it, the Duke Cartel thing for however many years, maybe before AJ joined, so maybe... Oh, yes, he was there he from the beginning. ...point where he was like, if it's not happening now... Because the other thing he'd mm. said to me was... You know, financially, you, you weren't mm. really making much, so it was yeah. like, you yeah. know, you get to a certain point, a certain age, where you're yeah. like, right, hey, if it's not happening, yeah. I need to mm. do something else here. And oh, absolutely, absolutely. LA is a very expensive place to live too. So yeah. if you're not making any money, well, you know, you just it, it can get pretty sketchy. Um, I'm, I'm surprised that we lasted that long. You know, it's it's very hard to go over there if you on a, a performer's visa and you can't get a job. You know, yeah. it's yeah. really hard. For I don't even see our bands would do it now. You know, because yeah. we got a little bit back in the day from the label. You know, but um, that I don't even think you even get that now. You know, it's just so different nowadays. Had had there been no issues at all with the management, do you think the band would have kept going? Yeah, po could po possibly yes, it could have possibly happened. Um, it, yeah, uh, management, yeah, we 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 had a bit. I think we had like three management or it that we went through. Uh, <laughs> it was just, I guess, just yeah, not happening, you know. Um, but. Um, it, it, it comes down to the, you know, the personalities, you know, sticky, being on that same page is important. And when, when all five of us is on that same page, it's just not going to work the way yeah. it should, you know. Um, but there's a, there's a, I really, I have no regrets about anything. There was, a, I learned so much in that band and just even from people, personalities, you know, and that is cool though. Musician. In this day and age, with the recording technology that we've got, it, it's cool the fact that most of it is documented, so you can quite yeah. easily just pop the name into YouTube, and if you want to yeah. go back and watch a, a performance at the Viper yeah. Room, or you know yeah. wherever it was, your, a radio show that you were playing, it is cool yes. that you can go back, you know, in 20 yeah. years, you'll still be able to go back and watch yourself when you were younger. Absolutely, and, I, and for my kids, you know, um, yeah. having having my little boy, it, it, I'm doing this all for him, just, you know, just to so he can look back at this because I can see him playing drums, but I'm not trying to force him to do it. So um, I want him to be involved in the music somehow, and I try to show him a lot of different music, yeah. as my did, that father did to me as well, you know. No, knowing what you know now, would you go back and do anything differently? No, wouldn't go back and do anything differently, you know. It, um, no, I had I had a great time. It was fun, you know. Yeah. Um, do you still now, keep in touch, guys? Yeah, I mean, look, we not not as frequently because everyone is just so busy. But you yeah. know, I do miss all of them, you know. And if we talk and we're in the same room, it will be just like old times, you know. But I guess it's crazy that Toby lives in America and Dale and Tommy's in Melbourne and I'm in Ballarat. And AJ's yeah. in Brazil. Uh, it's just really hard because we are getting older and we have families, and you know, it's it's just harder to stay in touch, I guess. You know, when life is just busy. Yeah. <laughs> so, what have you got good on nowadays? I've got a new band that I'm doing. A band that's from Melbourne. They called Alcatomic. They formed in '96. They did about three EPs, and then uh, they called it quits. I think in 2021 or maybe earlier, but anyway, I reached out, I, well, we got in touch with each other, and I started creating drums for him, right. and um, songs are great, so we have some music coming out mid this year, I've done just uh, the two videos, uh, we have an album coming out, so I've been creating music with, with this band, with Johnny, you know. What um, type of music is that, like what style? It's it's kind of like, the 90s kind of, it's that 90s era, so it has that electric power pop to it, um, really catchy stuff, you know. Um, I'm quite quite psyched about the the sound, how it turned out. So um, I'm really excited to to get it out there. Um, and with with, uh, with regard to Duke Cartel, uh, AJ had said that there's so much stuff recorded that was never oh, released. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's just planning on similar to that lost 
songs EP, do you think that over time you'll maybe just pop another EP yeah. out at some point and kind of you do know, that? Never, never, you will never know. Um, I, I don't really know at this time where everyone is, but if that opportunity pops up, I'll definitely be, be keen to do it. Um, yeah. It will be fun to just reconnect with all those guys and uh, to make music again, especially yeah. creating, creating the stuff that, that we really were about to release because some of it's sounding pretty good, you know. Um, so it was unfortunate that we never could release it, you know. Here's a question. Let's imagine there's a, a Duke Cartel WhatsApp chat. You, all, all the members are in this chat. If someone was to message and say, let's get the band back together, let, let's try it one more time, would you be up for it? You know, to be honest with you, if, for, I, couldn't, I couldn't be on the roads. I couldn't be doing the extensive touring that I did because of where I'm, where I'm at. I'll be up for creating music and, 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 and playing gigs here and there, but... I don't think I could get on the road for three months at a time yeah. and again. It's funny that you say that because I think the other guys are the same. Um, that you know, creating music, playing gigs, hundred percent. Yeah. But they're at that point in their life now where yeah. you know they've got a lot of them have got families now, yeah. or they've yeah. businesses, or they've got work, or they've, they've got life set up somewhere. That Absolutely. Position now that they they want. To go traveling, no. definitely you're in your twenties. Oh, hundred percent. When you're in your twenties, it's a different ball game, you know. Yeah. But we're a lot older now. Um, we'll probably slow down a lot more too. You know, I'm in bed by eight thirty nowadays. You know, get up at five. It's a yeah. complete one eighty from what I've done before. You know, get up at like four in the afternoon. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was. It's just a lot different nowadays. Um, so, Jay, bro, we've been quite um, serious up to this point. So. We're going to end thing on a few fun questions for you. Yeah, yeah. So I'd ask some of the other guys if they had any questions as well for you. <laughs> I, I don't know what these questions mean, but we'll, we'll see what happens, okay? So uh, Toby wants to know, what's better than killing two birds with one stone? Killing one bird with five stones. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it means <laughs> my misinterprets. I kind of make up my own things. <laughs> I was always a little bit crazy, the crazy one in the band. <laughs> and uh, Tommy wants to know what happened when Tommy asked you about your cornflakes in Sydney. Oh, yeah, he uh, he he was having some cereal. And uh, I was I was probably at a point where I was dealing with something heavy at my time, and he, and I was just asking him, "Are you having some cereal?" And he had a smart ass remark. That was just my last few. <laughs> so me and him kind of yeah, we went toe to toe for for that split sec. But yeah, so that's what happened. He 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 <laughs> he got smart. But normally I won't react like that. I was just he just got me at the worst time, I guess. And uh, yeah. We had a little disagreement, I guess. <laughs> Either you like conflicts or you don't. <laughs> no, I don't like conflict, man. No, no, not at all. You know, um, I'm actually pretty chill. Not conflict. Like not conflict. Cornflakes. <laughs> conflicts. No, I don't like cornflakes. No, sorry, your accent. <laughs> no, cornflakes. I don't. I don't mind cornflakes. I was just yeah trying to have a conversation, I guess, with them, yeah. but uh, so, it didn't work so well. J bro, imagine that you could go back in time. What's the one concert that you wish that you could have attended, that you could have witnessed? The in any band, you mean? Any band, oh, any time. I would have loved to see Motorhead. I would have yeah. loved to see Lemmy. Yeah, because I would see him around LA, but I never got to see Motorhead play, and that would have been awesome. Because I heard they were loud as hell. <laughs> my cousin my cousin was a big Motorhead fan, and uh, see that thing when you when you get a little bit older. You, if you go to a concert when you're younger, you push your way right down to the front, and you're yes, yes, proud, proud <laughs> jumping about. And then you get a little bit older, you kind of maybe go back a little bit and just watch. Yeah. I'll sit right on top where the seats are, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I always remember um, Motorhead were playing in Glasgow at the Barrowlands. Oh yes, venue. And uh, my cousin went along, and he was obviously just young at the time, so he was 
T-shirt off. Oh, yes. I'll get to the, the wash pit. And uh, they played for like two hours. And at the end of it, they finished up. The lights came on. And uh, the Barrowlands, similar to a lot of inside venues, you would get this layer of water on the floor because people would throw their beers. <laughs> and uh, so he'd obviously, two hours before it, took his T-shirt off and ran into the mosh pit. And uh, it just makes me laugh when you're younger because when we were walking out, he spotted his T-shirt lying on the ground and he just <laughs> rent it out and then he put it back on again. Sure we are. <laughs> Yeah, that only that would happen in Motorhead concert. Right? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, oh my gosh. Obviously, you play the drums. Is there another musical instrument that you wish that you could play? Piano. Piano would be a good one because then I can compose a lot more. It's very hard being a drummer. I mean, you you kind of learn when you're around musicians that create music. That's how I learned. And yep. um, would have loved to play piano or guitar just to create my own music. You know. Um, that's one thing that was a bit of a bummer, but I just focused so much into drumming that I, uh, I put everything into it. It's so funny that, focus was. That, that you wish that you could play something else because you'll know yourself when you're trying to start a band, there's a million guitarists, there's a million mm. bass players, a million singers. Is he trying yeah. to find a good drummer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. Like they say, a good drummer can make a bad band sound good. You yeah, know, but because that's the foundation. It's the drive. It's the groove. It's the feel. It's all that. The dynamics. You know, it's not just building a shed. Do you do you not get jealous sitting behind the drum kit? Because if you're playing live in front of people, the singer and the guitarist can go out there and they can showboat in front of the crowd and they can make mistakes and hide it. If you're a drummer and you make a mistake, everybody knows. <laughs> I just cough at the same time. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I just kind of try not to think about the mistake. The biggest mistake that you can make making a mistake is if you think too much about the mistake that you've made, you've already created another mistake. <laughs> so you just have to let it go really quick and just move forward. I try to just do that. Yeah, Jay, bro, um, as you know yourself, there is millions and millions of great songs that have been created and recorded over the years by different yep. artists. Yep. What's the one song that you wish that you could have been sat in the studio witnessing it being recorded? I would have loved to see The Pretender by The Foo Fighters. That song, The Pretender? That, yeah. That was a real good one. I would have loved to see that. That had a lot of energy. Um, I like, really dug that when that one came out. It was pretty epic. Yeah, I'm going to see, see The Foo, Foo Fighters in June. June, oh, July. They're in Scotland. They're so good. So good. They so I have so much respect for Dave Grohl. It's it's one of those bands I've I've not seen. I've seen most bands that I wanted to see. I've seen Foo Fighters is one of those bands I've just never seen yet. Oh wow! Now you'll be in for a surprise. And Josh Freeze, I mean, the dude is a machine as well. So yeah, yeah, you got I mean, to watch him play. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And last question for you, Mount Rushmore. Who is your four musicians or bands? whether it be performance, whether it be songwriting, whether it be the overall package, who are the four musicians or bands for yourself that are perfection? That I would, okay, that would be Dave Grohl, uh, Foo Fighters, um, Led Zeppelin was another one that I loved, She Had, and Tom Larkins, that drummer, he was a, a, a big inspiration to how I moulded myself as a rock drummer from watching him. Um, yeah. And then, you know, uh, I got into a lot of uh, Pantera, into the heavier stuff as well. Uh, my whole music goes from playing, I can listen to a blues song and then it will be into a metal or rock. I yeah. have a lot more broad, I guess because of the teachers that I've had, it, it was just different styles around me, being a drummer, because there's so much different styles with so many great playing, you know, so I dig into did, that whole thing. What do you think? Pantera, the Union. Pantera, the Union, you know, it's it's not the same, but they're doing a great job. They're doing a great job, you know. It's definitely cool to hear those songs live again. Oh, absolutely. But you know it's not Benny and you know it's not Dimebag, you know, it's it's like But it's pretty close. But, oh, but they're doing it so they're doing it so good. I mean they're doing it pretty close. It's just and you know. Bill these days is sounding great on the mic. 
Yeah, I'm both. They're probably a lot more health conscious these days as well. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there'll be that many black tooth grins before a gig. Maybe it'll be like funny, funny, funny and lame. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But hey, Jay, bro, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. It's likewise, my friend. And uh, I'll uh, I'll keep in touch. Yeah, I'll, absolutely. I'll, I'll give your new band a wee follow on social media. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I wish you all the success in the future, and especially for your wee one as well. Hopefully they'll grow up and show their old man how to play the drums properly. That's it, mate. That's it. That's what I'm working on. <laughs> Here's my man. Thank you. Awesome. Take care, mate. Have a good one. See ya.